Hello there guys, it's Joey and welcome back to I Can't Witch Without, the series in which every week I take a look at a particular item, be it flower, herb, crystal, resin, so on and so forth, that I incorporate regularly into my practice. So the disclaimer at the start of the video is, as always, you do not require these items in order to be a witch, it's just things that make a regular part and parcel of my witchy practice. So this week we are looking at ivy or gort as we have, as undoubtedly people on the Celtic path know, just entered the Ogham tree calendar month of ivy or gort and although the attribution of the months to the Ogham is a fairly modern practice uh, we believe it comes from the White Goddess by Graves rather than anything solidly in history, we're not sure. Uh, he based a lot of his workings on myths and legends and what he came into contact with, but obviously the Druid tradition is oral and it's difficult to know, but it's unlikely. However, working with the Ogham on a monthly basis is a really good practice as far as I'm concerned. It gets you into this idea of engaging with the Ogham on a month by month basis. It puts it into a sort of cyclic gratification I guess. It's, it's kind of like the fact that a lot of witches are quite used to working in the ideas of cycles. This is something that is not new to any witch. Work in the cycles of the seasons and in the wheel of the year depending on your uh, practice. You may or may not choose to follow the exact wheel of the year but you are aware of the seasons and the shifting and the energies within nature. And witches who work within the cycles of the moon and days of the week and, and so on and so forth. Depending upon an individual's practice they're at least aware of the idea of the cyclic nature of things, even to the point of life, death and rebirth, which is something that keys into a Celtic practice in particular. So that being said, we have moved into ivy and ivy or gort wasn't one of the ogham that I thought would be, but ended up being one of my absolute favourite ogham to work with. So it's not my birth ogham, obviously, but it does start at the end of September, moving into October and finishes just before Samhain. So it finishes around the 29th, I believe, of October. So it, it really embodies the energies of this time of the year and we're going to talk a little bit first about the generalized properties of the herb or plant itself and for that we always draw on two points of reference which is the Cunninghands Encyclopedia of Magical Herbs and the Herbal Compendium by Paul Beryl. The reason that I do this, that I draw from two particular resources is to give us a jumping off point and if people are new or unsure about the magical, metaphysical or spiritual properties before I start waffling on anyway, uh, then it gives them a place to start, two, two references, two resources to maybe check out. Uh, the Cunningham Encyclopedia of Magical Herbs is well known uh, and the Herbal Compendium by Paul Beryl is a book I would seriously recommend. It's amazing. It's really, really good for anybody working with herbs. It provides a lot more lore and in-depth detail. We'll then talk a little bit about the energies of this as an ogham. And an ogham is one of the letters of the druidic alphabet. It's used in magical work. It's used in sort of a spoken vocal druidic art form. I love the Ogham and I think it's really, really key to get to understand the Celtic path to actually embrace them. I think it's a wonderful experience. So in front of us we have a little bit of artwork here from the Celtic Tree Oracle and from the Plant Oracle, the 
I actually got the, the book out. One minute. <laughs> yeah, the Druid Plant Oracle. <clears throat> Let's actually have a look and see what the Druid Plant Oracle has to say about Ivy, I'd be interested. Hmm. Okay, maybe that's something in the Ogham part. We'll, we'll put that in the Ogham part. We'll just talk generally about the meanings of, of the plant first. So, Celtic tree Ogham. Druidic plant oracle. This is some actual vine of ivy from outside and there's a lot of ivy in England uh, and it's it's not the poisonous kind it's uh, your, your standard grounded ivy um, there's some lovely ivy around the village right now going bright red which I was kind of eyeing the pathway yesterday as I went on a walk hoping that I could uh, find a red leaf for you because I think it's absolutely spectacular when ivy turns red there's only a couple of weeks of the year it does it, in England anyway, and it's really spectacular. We used to have it growing outside the house, but the, the landlords cut it all down. Right, so, here we have a little bit of ivy and I've just sort of uh, ground it up a little bit. Uh, you can get it really, really fine if you like. This is sort of semi-ground up. And then here are some whole leaves in the bowl. Again, this is all from my own... Uh, I don't know. My own land, my own space. Uh, we don't technically own it, we rent, but it is from the land in which I live and work and work around and walk around and energise with and connect to and have a relationship with. And then of course my Ogham stave from my Ogham set, and you can see this is Gort here with the two diagonal lines. I be is it in the card as well? Yeah. So if you can see right there it's within the Druidic plant oracle as well. These cards are absolutely stunning. Stunning. Right, so from Cunningham's Encyclopedia, Ivy is given as Gort, feminine, satin, water. Deities are Bacchus, Dionysus, Dionysus, I can never say that, and Osiris. Powers of protection and healing. Ritual uses. The thyrus used in worshipping Bacchus was often wound around with Ivy. Magical uses. Ivy is carried by women for good luck and is worn by brides for the same reason. Where ivy is grown or strewn, it guards against negativity and disaster. It is also used in fidelity and love charms. It is magically paired to holly. So, <coughs> uh, that tends to be a Christmas association, oddly enough. Uh, I, I don't know why... It's become so attached to Christmas imagery when really ivy is, is probably one of those all year round plants and it's very, very much noticeable, at least now, while it's changing its colour and, and the leaves fall off. So, <laughs> there you go. But the holly and the ivy is from a well-known Christmas carol and is used in pagan cycles quite frequently. We are in harvest season and it's too warm for me to have the windows shut, so you'll have to forgive me for the big noises of tractors full of potatoes going past. Paratiritar, boil and mash them, stick them in a stew. Right, so holly and ivy is used within at least pagan cycles for uh, the symbolism of the unification of male and female quite frequently, and ivy, as we have said, is feminine. So from the compendium, again, satin. Herb of Consecration, Herb of Immortality, Herb of Love, Invocational to Attis, Bacchus, Sibyl, Dionysus, and Osiris. Law. Ivy has twinned itself solidly into our herbal history and law. It was highly respected by the ancients, in particular the Greeks, who wove it into crowns worn to celebrate victory. Its tenacity and ability to survive most climates possibly led to its reputation as a herb of fidelity and valour. In a modern herbal, we learn more about this aspect of ivy. Its leaves formed the poet's crown as well as the wreath of Bacchus to whom the plant was dedicated, probably because of the practice of binding the brow with ivy leaves to prevent intoxication. 
a quality formerly attributed to the plant. We are told by old writers that the effects of intoxication by wine are removed if a handful of ivy leaves are bruised and gently boiled in wine and drunk. The Greek priests presented a wreath of ivy to newly married persons and the ivy throughout the ages has been regarded as an emblem of fidelity. The custom of decorating houses and churches with ivy at Christmas was forbidden by one of the early councils of the church on account of its pagan association, but the custom still remains. In former days, English taverns bore over the doors the sign of an ivy bush to indicate the excellence of the liquor supplied within, hence the saying, good wine needs no bush. Ivy is associated with the likes of Dionysus and Bacchus. These lusty gods bring to mind the Disney images where they are wreathed with mirth and ivy, but ancient mythers connect their affinity with this herb in other ways as well. Dionysus was once Sorry, Dionysus once escaped pirates by magically filling their boats with ivy. Ivy was consumed during the Bacchanalian festivals. I think I said that right. Bacchanalian. Fraser in the Golden Bough tells us that this led to inspired fury. There is another aspect of ivy found among Greek paganism. A minor deity, Attis, was worshipped by a cult of priests who castrated themselves. Attis was a shepherd known for his sensual beauty. The legend of Attis, as told in myths and legends of all nations, was that he was tormented by his desire for Sybil until he could bear it no longer and unmanned himself. Priests of Attis went through extensive ritual preparations for their initiation, which included fasting, purification and being bathed in the fresher blood of a bull. Castration was also included in some of their rites. These priests were readily recognised by the pattern of ivy tattooed on their flesh. Although not widespread, there are priests and priestesses today who celebrate, uh, sorry, who practice celebra celibacy, for whom ivy might provide additional strength. Stuart Farrar writes in the Eight Sabbaths for Witches about another myth, one found in the legends of Robin Hood. In the popular superstition, Robin himself escaped up the chimney in the form of a robin, and when Yule ended, went out as Berlin against his rival Bran, or Saturn. Bran hid from the pursuit in the ivy bush disguised as a golden crest wren, but Robin always caught and hanged him. We find ivy in the old Irish alphabet as the letter G, or Gort. In Egypt, it was considered a sacred herb of Osiris, as grave rites in the white goddess, ivy has long been associated with Saturn Saturnalia, ivy being the nest of the gold crest wren, the bird belonging to the god Saturn. <coughs> Usage. Ivy may be woven into wreaths and included in floral arrangements when decorating for the union of a couple, acknowledging desired success for the marriage. Ivy might also represent victory, or the virtues of this herb may be used to enhance celebrations. Capable of invoking gods known for their joy of revelry and late night partying, Ivy is said to prevent drunkenness. <laughs> I suspect this would only be the case if the vine were used to bind the hands of one prone to excess. <laughs> there is odd comments like that in this book that make it worth reading just by itself. Goodness. Ivy is also associated with the pursuit of pentacles as this ritual tool. When consecrating individual cards and portions of your deck, there are a variety of interesting ways one might use ivy. A piece of vine could be used to bind the silk wrapping this for the suit of pentacles, or the wooden stem chopped and ground to use as an incense when studying this suit. Now that's fascinating. That's really interesting stuff. Uh, you will find in a lot of tarot decks that ivy does creep in. Uh, to the pentacles and the pentacle artwork. It happens a lot. I th believe the Shadowscapes has quite a lot of uh, ivy in it, its cards. So that's really lovely. I really like the idea of creating a taro herbal blend to study the earth suit with. It's really neat. consider that. Right. Wreaths of ivy may be worn for Beltane Eve. 
Ivy may be woven into the structure of the temple as well. Deck the halls with boughs of ivy is more than a line from a yuletide carol. Ivy's association with many of the sabbats is worthy of attention. Not only is ivy used at Yule and Beltane, Farrow refers to Dorian Valentine's description of ivy at Candlemas, or in bulk. <coughs> Sorry, I'm a frog, a frog in my throat. <laughs> oh, there we go. A time when ivy's place decoratively at once temples. Uh, temple space rather than temple head. Right. Hmm. Fascinating. Interesting. Interesting stuff. Okay. Doki. Then. So, then we move on to the Ogum. And for me, When you first approach Ivy, there is a lot of law that talks about the perseverance. And it's one of those energies that quite a few people are quite oddly sort of forewarning you about. Uh, when you have Ivy, it, you know, you have something that you have to overcome, you have to persevere, you just have to break the walls down, you have to get through it. And it can be about that. But there is a deep spirituality attached to ivy. And every time I've come into contact with it, it's more about getting to know who you are on every level and embrace the spirals of life. Now, ivy grows around other plants and it can suffocate other plants to death if left unchecked. It grows like crazy and it spirals around other plants. So it has an element of the fact that it can destroy, it can be really destructive. And because of this idea, it becomes, in some people's minds, something to be a little bit worried about, something to be a little bit afraid of. I'm going to read to you The Tree Ogun by Glennie Kindred, and, and you'll see what I mean. There is a fierce, determined power to ivy. It has the ability to bind trees together and restrict passage through. It can eventually smother and kill a tree, even the mighty oak. Should a dense ivy thicket appear in one of your other world journeys, you should stop immediately and examine your motives, either there or in your life. This destructive aspect of the ivy is a warning about wandering without thought and attention to the why and how of what you are doing. The ivy represents the search for the self and the wandering of the soul in its desire for enlightenment. It will link you to others through the, co the group collective soul. It is up to you to understand whether your wanderings restrict and bind or unite instead. Freedom means going where you choose, but it is where you choose to go which will reveal your true perspective. <clears throat> it is what you choose to do with that freedom that will tell you much about what aspect of yourself needs healing. And then generalised meanings for Ivy. Breaking down barriers, perseverance, persistence. And then in reverse, often feeling constricted, restrictions and ruthlessness. Magical uses of luck and overcoming obstacles are given to the Ogum in particular. But for me, when I was really engaging with this particular Ogum, <coughs> it came into sharp relief about the, the spiral of life, which connected to me through the Nine Ladies of Avalon. And the spiral of overcoming is uh, what the spell work was that I provided and, and did a setup already and is already on the channel for Gort or Ivy. I seem to have a deep respect for the energies of particular plants, trees, 
how whatever you want to say that a lot of people seem to be far too quick to judge and give a negative association to I think it comes from following the Morrigan path because so many people are keen to sort of besmirch the name of the goddess Morrigan as being negative and bloodthirsty and all the rest of it so when I come into contact with other elements of a Celtic druidic path that a lot of people seem quick to dismiss, disregard or sort of attach a level of fear to, I tend to sort of feel like taking it in into, into myself and being like right <laughs> let's let's find out what this is really about because let's question that because I don't like that, I don't like the idea of particular plants being labelled as a nuisance or a problem or this that and the other. It happened with bindweed as well. Bindweed is another one that uh, spirals around and can indeed, if left unchecked, suffocate other plants and take over. And for me there's something of this wild ferocity that reminds me when examining the energies of such plants including ivy that I think it shows where we're at with regards to how much we fear our wild primal self. I think if we're deeply afraid of these energies that refuse to be cultivated and kept in a box and will do whatever it takes to break the walls and break down the barriers, then that might go towards showing that we ourselves cling to the idea of structure and routine and order more than we ought that we are afraid of change, that we are afraid of growth and I think it's important for us to really examine what being spiritually wild means to us. Is it something that we are afraid of? Is there something we need to embrace? Is it something that we need to take a good long look at? And don't forget that ivy is associated with the energy of earth and the tarot set pentacles and I think nowhere is it more obvious than <clears throat> in a lot of tarot decks how we are determined to civilize certain energies. One second I'm just going to grab some water. Apologies I am still a little under the weather, still a bit snickly so I had needed to grab another bottle of water. Right so what I was saying is that nowhere is it more obvious about how we as a human race try to civilize <coughs> the energies of earth into a home hearth stead than in tarot sets. I have whole videos about this. <coughs> How we cleanse out, civilise and restrict the energies of earth and it's, it's, a, it's a subject deep to my heart, I'm an earth sign and within astrology and within tarot decks for a lot not all, a lot not all of imagery it becomes boring it becomes about wealth in terms of the material and it loses its sensuality, it loses its primar primal energies, its primality, if that makes sense, if that's, I'm pretty sure that's a word, I might be making it up, I'm still not fully 100%. It loses its deep magic, it loses its wildness and nowhere is that to me more obvious than in a lot of tarot decks with to do with earth it's it's overly overly civilized like we need to feel safe in our homes and we need to control the world around us rather than engage with those wild energies we need to feel that we fit in our boxes and we're safe and everything is good and i think we lose something through modern living we lose a bit of ourselves, we lose a little bit of our primal self, our wild self and we try and <clears throat> I don't know, almost dehumanise the idea of the, the wild, the 
the primal, the fierce. And plants such as ivy get a bad name because, you know, oh, they can't be cultivated, they can't be civilised, they break things, they uh, run rampant if left unchecked. And it takes a lot of effort to work with ivy. And at the same time, it's become one of those sort of idyllic images that's just associated with sort of country living, which is the ivy up the side of the house. Oh, it's pretty and we want to make it into this pretty little plant that grows up the sides of houses and and I get it, you know, <clears throat> there was ivy up the side of this house. And it's, it's one of those strange things uh, about the human consciousness, because maybe that ties into the fact that at one point ivy was used to decorate temples and was used up the side of walls as, as part of temple decorations. <clears throat> it's, it's just something that bugs me slightly about the plants which are really, really tenacious and really persistent and really they break down walls. They can be used to help you transition and transform your path. This is true of, of all of the plants that wrap around and, and twist and, and, and they really show something about like the true nature of life. Uh, the wraps, the twists, the bends is where you learn all about yourself. The minute that you fall behind and have to go back in order to go forward is one of the most frustrating experiences in a human being's life where you feel like you, you're having to go back uh, and you're having to revisit old ground but really what's happening is you are coming full circle preparing to break through and nothing is more restrictive than resisting this process of breaking down the old cycles, breaking down the change so that you can embrace it and go forward. And I think this is part of why Ogham is attributed to this time of the year. We are truly getting ready <coughs> and ramping up into Samhain, Halloween. And for witches, that's all about New Year, right? So it's the beginning. It is the moment of birth of that particular year. So <coughs> Ivy falls into that preparation energy <coughs> that getting ready, that spiralling back, examining everything, and then going on, going forward. The spiral of life is a very interesting concept, and it, it falls into Celtic mythos and symbolism really, really easily. It's a, a beautiful. It, it works with the labyrinth imagery as well. And... Um, <coughs> <coughs> ivy is a plant which I would consider synonymous with labyrinths as well, thinking about it. It throws up images of mazes and ivy being part and parcel of that, and hedgerows and things of that nature too. So, What can Ivy teach us in terms of our personal witchy path or our personal spiritual path or our magical workings? Well, first and foremost, Ivy is a plant of never give up. Perseverance is something which is often given a rather negative overture when really it's a warrior thing. Ivy is a warrior plant. It might be why I love it. And basically this warrior plant tells us that we never ever give up. We might get knocked down, we might get broken, we might be put into pain, but we never ever give up. We just keep going. It also talks a little bit about the nature of support. <clears throat> because Ivy shows us the positive and negative side of having a support system in place which is very true of human beings and their relationships to others so in the positive sense the two plants the tree and the ivy can coexist and they can create a almost a hybrid but it not quite it's almost like a, a 
culturing its own environments. They, they sort of live off one another. But then on the other hand, ivy can suffocate the plants and trees or vines or whatever that it is growing on. It, it can destroy and, and kill, which goes to show that too much dependence or reliance uh, can cause harm. It's, it talks a little bit about being over dependent on a support system, whatever support system that can be within a witch's life. And it's important, I think, for witches to really examine themselves in that term of are we overly dependent on one particular thing? And that can be anything. It can be on a human capacity. It can be, you know, are we over-reliant on substances, food, drink, drugs? Uh, <clears throat> are we too comfortable in our current situation? Are we not breaking down the barriers? Are we too reliant on this state of affairs that we don't push ourselves through? And are we really examining who we are and really breaking down the walls of who we are? Because quite often we set up these very rigid structures for ourselves, for who we are as witches and who we are as people and what defines us as a person and what defines us as a witch and what defines our personal path. And <clears throat> that's something to me which is problematic. Because the minute we become comfortable in our label, in our definition is exactly the moment we should be breaking it to pieces. We should never ever be stagnant and still we should always be growing, persevering and spiralling just like Ivy teaches us. However we should be seeking to spiral upwards from the earth to the sky and not get stuck, not be spiralling out of control but rather have an idea of the destination it, we shouldn't ever say that is definitely the only destination that we're going to go in because <coughs> that's not growth. <coughs> growth is to harness the situations around us, to imbibe that which is positive and helpful as well as that which is not helpful and, and learn from that and, and grow and, and seek the path which we can never really know the true destination, we just have to grow and, and keep persevering. And like I said, the Ivy Gort Ogham for me was very much associated with the Nine Ladies of Avalon and the Nine Priestesses of Avalon from uh, Avalonic Myth. And that to me became sort of synonymous with the idea of a spiritual growth, a spiritual perfection, a place of spirituality which opens us up to receiving messages from the gods. And Ivy became about our connection to earth and sky. Now, earth and sky are two of the druidic principles, uh, Celtic principles if you like, elements uh, often used instead of the four elements which are used in modern practice, druidic ones tend to be earth, sea and sky. So ivy for me is synonymous with the relationship between earth and sky, not so much sea, but uh, it really really makes us examine our roots and where we've come from and our relationship to the earth as I've discussed and, and really taking a better look at how we interact with ourselves, our physical selves and who we are as people to sort of take on have we sort of over sanitized ourselves, do we need to rewild ourselves, do we need to go back to nature. <clears throat> and then it spirals in that beautiful imagery of spiritual evolution and discovery towards the sky, towards the heavens. So we are constantly looking up, we're constantly reaching, we're constantly searching, we're constantly examining the sky. And for me examining the sky is something deeply spiritual and moving. I think the sky is one of the most incredible spiritual 
energies in our world that is not mentioned often enough. The sky is constantly changing. It's constantly in flux. It has this beautiful, rich tapestry of imagery, all of its own, and this deep hue of colour which changes on a daily cycle. So we have come full circle full circle we have come full circle i don't know what that is don't ask me <laughs> we've come full circle to our idea of cycles so the sky is full of clouds and we can read those and, and we look for signs in them we look for imagery in them we divine from the sky we divine from bird signs and things in the sky we <clears throat> go out and we look at the stars in the night sky and look for meaning and astrology and divination all associated with stars. We look up at the moon and the shifting of the cycles for the moon <clears throat> and connect to our goddess and the energies through it and there's something deeply spiritual. And for me there are particular times of day, sunset, dusk, sunrise, when these times of these energies, these hues of colour become this incredible moving experience and you can feel it on the inside like oh and you can feel the spiritual pull of those times and the sky lights up in this crescendo of colour which really touches my soul and is just like this is the magic of the world around us. So that's the magic of the sky and Gort reminds us to always be spiralling upwards, to always reach towards that magic. And to be grounded in earth and to keep reaching to the sky is the personal responsibility, I guess, of personal transformation. <clears throat> to become a better person, to be the best version of you, which is something I say a lot. But there you go. It, it keeps you grounded in love of the earth, but keeps you re-examining that earth. <clears throat> and then keeps you hopeful and looking upwards and working up and spiralling and, and persevering and being determined so that you can improve, so you can break down the barriers, so you can smash apart the labels, so that you can be who you want to be and grow. And that's what I think Ivy is all about. So that's it for this week for I Can't Witch Without Ivy. I hope you enjoyed, despite me coughing. <laughs> Many blessings.